Citizens. Before entering into the subject matter, allow me to make a few preliminary remarks. There reigns now on the continent a real epidemic of strikes, a general clamor for a rise of wages. The question will turn up at our Congress. You, as head of the International Association, ought to have settled convictions upon this paramount question. For my own part, I considered it therefore my duty to enter fully into the matter, even at the peril of putting your patience to a severe test. Another preliminary remark I have to make in regard to uh, Citizen Weston. He has not only proposed to you, but has publicly defended the interest of the working class as he thinks, opinions which he knows to be most unpopular with the working class. Such an exhibition of moral courage all of us must highly honor. I hope that despite the unvarnished style of my paper, at its conclusion he will find me agreeing with what appears to me the just idea at the bottom of his theses, which however in their present form I cannot but consider theoretically false and practically dangerous. I shall now at once proceed to the business before us. Citizen Weston's argument rested, in fact, upon two premises. Firstly, the amount of national production is a fixed thing, a constant quantity or magnitude, as the mathematicians would say. Secondly, that the amount of real wages, that is to say, of wages as measured by the quantity of commodities they can buy, is a fixed amount, a constant magnitude. Now his first assertion is evidently erroneous. Year after year, you will find that the value and mass of production increase, that the productive powers of national labor increase, and that the amount of money necessary to circulate the increasing production continuously changes. What is true at the end of the year and for different years compared with each other is true for every average day of the year. The amount or magnitude of national production changes continuously. It is not a, qu not a constant, but a variable magnitude. And apart from changes in population, it must be so. Because of the continuous changes in the accumulation of capital and the productive powers of labor, it is perfectly true that if a rise in the general rate of, of wages should take place today, that rise, whatever its ulterior effects might be, would by itself not immediately change the amount of production. It would, in the first instance, proceed from the existing state of things. But before the rise of wages, the national production was variable and not fixed it will continue to be variable and not fixed after the rise of wages. But suppose the amount of national production to be constant instead of variable. Even then, what our friend Weston considers a logical conclusion would still remain a gratuitous assertion. If I have, given an, if I have a given number, say eight, the absolute limits of this number do not prevent its parts from changing their relative limits. If profits were six and wages were two, wages might increase to six and profits decrease to two, and still the total amount remain eight. This fix, the fixed amount of production would by no means prove the fixed amount of wages. How then does our friend Weston prove this fixity? by asserting it. But even conceding him this, his assertion, it would cut both ways, while he presses it only in one direction. If the amount of wages is a constant magnitude, then it can be neither increased nor diminished. If then, in enforcing a temporary rise of wages, the working class men act foolishly, the capitalists, in enforcing a temporary fall of wages, 
would not act less foolishly. Our friend Weston does, does not deny that, under cer certain circumstances, working men can enforce a rise in wages. But their amount being naturally fixed, there must follow a reaction. On the other hand, he knows also that the capitalists can enforce a fall of wages, and indeed, continually try to enforce it. According to the principle of the constancy of wages, a reaction ought to follow in this case, not less than the former. The working men, therefore, reacting against the attempt at, or the act of, lowering wages would act rightly. They would, therefore, act rightly in enforcing a rise of wages because every reaction against the lowering of wages is an action for raising wages. According to Citizen Weston's own principle of the constancy of wages, the working men ought, therefore, under certain circumstances, to combine and struggle for a rise of wages. If he, def if he denies this conclusion, he must give up the premise from which it flows. He must not say that the amount of wages is a constant quantity, but that although it cannot and must not rise, it can and must fall whenever capital pleases to lower it. If the capitalist pleases to feed you upon potatoes instead of upon meat, and upon oats instead of upon wheat, you must accept his will as the law of political economy and submit to it. If in one country the rate of wages is higher than in another, in the United States, for example, than in England, you must explain this difference in the rate of wages by a difference between the will of the American capitalist and the will of the English capitalist, a method which would certainly very much simplify not only the study of economic phenomena, but of all other phenomena. But even then, we might ask, why the will of the American capitalist differs from the will of the English capitalist? And to answer the question, you must go beyond the domain of will. A person may tell me that God wills one thing in France and another thing in England. If I summon him to explain this duality of will, he might have the brass to answer that God has to have one will in France and another will in England. But our friend Weston is certainly the last man to make an argument of such a complete neg negation of all reasoning. The will of the capitalist is certainly to take as much as possible. What we have to do is not talk about his will, but to inquire into his power, the limits of that power, and the character of those limits. Citizen Weston read to us might have been compressed into a nutshell. All his reasoning amounted to this. If the working class forces the capitalist class to pay five shillings instead of four shillings in the shape of money wages, the capitalist will return in the shape of commodities four shillings worth instead of five shillings. The working class would have to pay five shillings for what before the rise of wages they bought with four shillings. But why is this the case? <clears throat> why does the capitalist only return four shillings worth for five shillings? Because the amount of wages is fixed. But why is it fixed at four shillings worth of commodities? Why not at three, or two, or any other sum? If the limit of the amount of wages is settled by an economical law, independent alike of the will of the capitalist and, and, and the will of the working man, the first thing Citizen Weston had to do was to state that the law and prove it. He ought then, moreover, to have proved that the amount of wages actually paid and at every given moment always corresponds exactly to the necessary amount of wages and never deviates from it. <clears throat> if, 
On the other hand, the given amount of wages is founded on the mere will of the capitalist or the limits of his avarice. It is an arbitrary limit. There is nothing necessary in it. It may be changed by the will of the capitalist and may therefore be changed against his will. Citizen Weston illustrated his theory by telling you that a bowl contains a certain quantity of soup to be eaten by a certain number of persons. An increase in the broadness of spoons would produce no increase in the amount of soup. He must allow me to find this illustration rather spoony. It reminded me somewhat of the simile employed by Mencius Agrippa. When the Roman plebeians struck against the patricians, the patrician Agrippa told them that the patrician belly fed the plebeian members of the body politic. Agrippa failed to show that you feed the members of one man by filling the belly of another. Citizen Weston, on his part, has forgotten that the bowl from which the workmen eat is filled with the whole produce of national labor, and that what prevents them from fetching more out of it is neither the na narrowness of the bowl nor the scantiness of its contents, but only the smallness of their spoons. <clears throat> By what contrivance is the capitalist enabled to return four shillings worth for five shillings. <clears throat> By raising the price of the commodity he sells. Now, does a rise, and more generally, a change in the prices of commodities, do the prices of commodities themselves depend on the mere will of the capitalist? Or, on the contrary, certain cir circumstances wanted to give effect to that will? If not, the ups and downs the incessant fluctuation of market prices becomes an insoluble riddle. Are we, are we, as we suppose that no change whatever has taken place either in the productive powers of labor or the amount of capital and labor employed or the value of money wherein the values of products are estimated but only a change in the rate of wages, how could that rise of wages affect the prices of commodities? Only by affecting the actual proportion between the demand for and the supply of these commodities. It is perfectly true that considered as a whole, the working class spends and must spend its income upon necessaries. A general rise in the rate of wages would therefore produce a rise in the demand for, and consequently, the market prices of necessaries. The capitalists who produce these necessaries would be compensated for the risen wages by, rise, by the rising market prices of their commodities. But how would the other capitalists who do not produce necessaries? And you must not fancy them a small body. If you consider that two-thirds of the national produce are consumed by one-fifth of the population, a member of the House of Commons stated recently to be but one-seventh of the population, you will understand what an immense proportion of the national produce must be produced in the shape of luxuries, or be exchanged for luxuries and what an immense amount of the necessaries themselves must be wasted upon flunkies, horses, cats, and so forth. A waste we know from experience to become always much limited with the rising prices of necessaries. Well, what would, what would be the position of those capitalists who do not produ produce necessaries? For the fall in the rate of profit consequent upon the ro general rise of wages they could not compensate themselves by a rise in the price of their commodities because the demand for those commodities would not have increased. Their income would have decreased. And from this decreased income, they would have to pay more for the same amount of higher price necessaries. But this would not be all. As their income had diminished, they would have less to spend upon luxuries. And therefore, 
their mutual demand for their respective commodities would diminish. Consequent upon this diminished demand, the prices of their commodities would fall. In these branches of industry, therefore, the rate of profit would fall, not only in simple proportion to the general raise of wages, but the compound ratio of the general rise of wages, the rises in the prices of necessaries, and the fall in the prices of, of luxuries. What would be the consequence of this difference in the rates of profit for capital is employed in different branches of industries? Why the consequence that generally obtains from whatever reason, the average prop rate of profit comes to differ in different spheres of production. Capital and labor would be transferred from the less remunerative to the more remunerative branches. And, and this process of transfer would go on until the supply in the one department of industry would have risen proportionately to the increased demand and would have sunk in the other departments according to the decreased demand. This change affected the general rate of profit would again be equalized in different branches. As the whole derangement originally arose from a mere change in the proportion of the demand for and the supply of different commodities, the cause ceasing, the effect would cease, and prices would return to their formal, former level and equilibrium. Instead of being limited to some branches of industry, the fall in the rate of profit consequent upon a rise of wages would have become general. According to our supposition, there would have taken, taken place no change in the productive powers of labor, nor the aggregate amount of production. But that given amount of production would have changed its form. A greater part of the produce would exist in the shape of necessaries, a lesser part in the shape of luxuries or what comes to the same, a lesser part would be exchanged for foreign luxuries and be consumed in its original form, or what again comes to the same, a greater part of the native produce would be exchanged for foreign necessaries instead of luxuries. The general rise in the, in the rate of wages would therefore, after a temporary disturbance of market prices, only result in a general fall in the rate of profit without any permanent change in the prices of those commodities. If I am told that in the previous argument I assume the whole of surplus of wages to be spent on necessaries, I answer that I have made the supposition most advantageous to the opinion of Citizen Weston. If surplus wages were spent upon articles formally not entering into the consumption of working men, the real increase of their purchasing power would need no proof. Being, however, only derived from an advance of wages, that increase of their purchasing power must exactly correspond to the decrease of purchasing power of capitalists. The aggregate demand for commodities would therefore not increase, but the constituent parts of that demand would change. The increasing demand on the one side would be counterbalanced by the decreasing demand on the other side. Thus the aggregate demand remaining stationary, no change whatever could take place in the market prices of commodities. You arrive, therefore, at this dilemma. Either the surplus wages are equally spent upon all articles of consumption, then the expansion of demand on the part of the working class must be compensated by a contradiction or a contraction of demand on the part of the capitalist class. Or the surplus wages are only spent upon articles whose market prices will temporarily rise. The consequent rise in the rate of profit in some and consequent fall in the rate of profit in other branches of industry 
will produce a change in the distribution of capital and labor going on until the supply is brought up to the increased demand in the one department of industry and brought down in the diminished demand on the, in the other department of industry. On the supposition there will occur no change in the prices of commodities. <clears throat> on the other supposition, after some fluctuations of market prices, the exchangeable values of commodities will subside to the formal level. On both suppositions, the general rise in the rate of wages will ultimately result in nothing else but a general fall in the rate of profit. To stir up your powers of imagination, Citizen Weston requested you to think of difficulties which a general rise of English agricultural wages from 9 shillings to 18 shillings would produce. Think, he explained, of the immense rise in the demand for necessaries and the consequent fearful rise in their prices. Now all of you know the average wages of the American agricultural laborer amount to more than double the English agricultural laborer, although the prices of agricultural produce are lower in the United States than in the United Kingdom. Although the general relations of cap capital and labor obtained in the United States are, are, the, are the same as in England, and although the annual amount of production is much smaller in the United States than in England. Why then does our friend ring this alarm bell? Simply to shift the real question before us. A sudden rise of wages from nine shillings to 18 shillings would be a sudden rise to the amount of 100%. Now, we are not all, at all discussing the question of whether the general rate of wages in England could be suddenly increased by 100%. We have nothing at all to do with the magnitude of, that, of the rise, which in every practical instance must depend on and be suited to given circumstances. We have only to inquire how a general rise in the rate of wages, even if restricted to 1%, will act. Dismissing friend Weston's fancy rise of 100%, I propose calling your attention to the real rise of wages that took place in Great Britain from 1849 to 1859. You are all aware of the 10 hours bill, or rather the 10 and a half hours bill, introduced since 1848. This was one of the greatest economical changes we have witnessed. It was a sudden and compulsory rise of wages, not in some local trades, but in leading industrial branches by which England sways the markets of the world. It was a rise of wages under circumstances singularly unpropitious. Dr. Ur, Professor Senior, and all other official economical mouthpieces of the middle class and here I must give an aside. The aristocracy was the upper class in Great Britain, while the capitalists composed what was known to Marx as the middle class. Not to continue. Proved, and I must say upon much stronger grounds than those of our friend Weston, that it would, be, it would sound the death knell of English industry. They proved that it not only amounted to a simple rise of wages, but to a rise of wages initiated by and based upon the diminution of the quantity of labor employed. They asserted that the 12th hour he wanted to take from the capitalist was exactly the only hour from which he derived his profit. They threatened a decrease of accumulation rise of prices, loss of markets, stinting of production, consequent reaction upon wages, ultimate ruin. In fact, they declared Maximilian Robespierre's maximum laws to be a small fare compared, compared to it. 
And they were right in a certain sense. Well, what was the result? A rise of money wages of the factory operatives, despite the curt curtailing of the working day, a great increase in the number of factory hands employed, a continuous fall in the prices of their products, a marvelous development in productive powers of their labor, an unheard of pro progression or progressive expansion of the markets for their commodities. In Manchester, at the meeting in 1860 of the Society for the Advancement of Science, I myself heard Mr. Newman confess that he, Dr. Orr, Sr., and all other official propounders of economical science had been wrong, whilst the instinct of the people had been right. I mentioned Mr. W. Newman, not Professor Francis Newman, because he occupies an eminent position in economical science as the contributor to and editor of Mr. Thomas Took's History of Prices, that magnificent work which traces the history of prices from 1793 to 1856. If our friend Weston's fixed idea of a fixed amount of wages, a fixed amount of production, a fixed degree of the productive power of labor, a fixed amount, a fixed a perma and permanent will of the capitalist, and all of this, his other fixedness and final finality were correct, Professor Senior's woeful for forebodings would have been right. And Robert Owen, who already in 1816 proclaimed a general limitation of the working day as the first preparatory step to the emancipation of the working class, and actually in the teeth of general prejudice, inaugurated it in his own hook in his cotton factory at New Lanark, would have been wrong. In the very same period during which the introduction of the 10 hours bill and the rise of wages consequent upon it occurred, there took place in Great Britain, for reasons which would be out of place to enumerate here, a general rise in agricultural wages. Although it is not required for my immediate purpose, in order not to mislead you, I shall make some preliminary remarks. and if his wages rose to four shillings, the rate of wages would have risen by 100%. This would seem a very magnificent thing if expressed as a rise of the rate of wages, although the actual amount of wages, four shillings weekly, would remain wretchedly small, a starvation pittance. You must not, therefore, Allow yourselves to be carried away by high-sounded percents of wages. You must always ask, what was the original amount? Moreover, you will understand that if there were ten men receiving two shillings per week, five men receiving five shillings, and five men receiving eleven shillings weekly, the twenty men together would receive one hundred shillings or five pounds weekly. If then, a rise, say, by 20% upon the aggregate sum of their weekly wages took place, there would be an advance from five to six pounds. Taking the average, we might say that the general rate of wages had risen by 25%, although, in fact, the wages of the ten men had remained stationary. The wages of the one lot of five men had risen from five to six shillings and uh, the wages of the other lot of five from 55 shillings to 70 shillings. One half of the men would not have improved at all their position. One quarter would have improved it in an imperceptible degree, and only one quarter would have been bettered, bettered it, really. Still, reckoning by the average, the total amount of wages of those 20 men would have increased 25%. And as far as the aggregate capital that employs them, the prices of the commodities they produced are concerned, 
it would be exactly this, the same as if all of them had equally shared the average rise of wages. In the case of agricultural labor, the standard of wages being very different in different countries of England and Scotland, the rise affected them very unequally. Lastly, during the period when the, that rise of wages took place, counteracting influences were at work, such as new taxes consequent upon the Russian war the extensive demolition of dwelling houses of agricultural laborers, and so forth. Having premised so much, I, I proceed to state that from 1849 to 1859, there took place a rise of about 40% in the average rate of agricultural wages in Great Britain. I could give you ample examples in proof of my assertion, but for the present purpose, I think it's sufficient to refer you to the conscientious and, and critical paper read by, written in 1860 by the late Mr. John C. Morton at the London Society of Arts on, quote, the forces used in agriculture, unquote. Mr. Morton gives the returns from bills and other authentic documents which he had collected from about 100 farmers residing in 12 Scotch and 35 English counties. According to our friend Weston's opinion, and taken together with simultaneous rise of wages of factory operatives, there ought to have occurred a tremendous rise in prices of agri agricultural produce during the period of 1849 to 1859. But what is the fact? Despite the Russian War and consecutive unfavorable harvests from 1854 to 1856, the average price of wheat, which is the leading agricultural produce of England, fell from about three pounds per quarter for the years 1838 to 1848 to about two pounds shillings per quarter, uh, two pounds ten shillings per quarter for the years 1849 to 1859. This constitutes a fall in the price of wheat of more than 16 percent simultaneously with an average rise of agricultural wages of 40 percent. During the same period, if we compare its end with its beginning, 1859 with 1849, there was a decrease of official pauperism from 934,419 to 860,470, the difference being 73,949, a very small decrease, I grant, and which in the following years was again lost, but still a decrease. It might be said, consequent upon the abolition of the Corn Laws, the import of foreign corn was more than doubled during the period of 1849 to 1859, as compared with the period of 1838 to 1848. And what of that? From Citizen Weston's standpoint, one would have expected that this sudden, immense, and continuously increasing demand upon foreign markets must have sent the, up the prices of agricultural produce there to a frightful height. The effect of increased demand remaining the same, whether it comes from without or from within. What was the fact? Apart from some years of failing harvests, during all that period, the ruinous fall in the price of corn formed a standing theme of declamation in France. The Americans were again compelled to burn their surplus, and Russia, if we are to believe Mr. Urquhart, prompted the Civil War in the United States because her agricultural exports were crippled by the Yankee competition in the markets of Europe. Reduced to its abstract form, Citizen Weston's argument would come to this. Every rise in demand always occurs on the basis of a given amount of production. It can, therefore, never increase the supply of articles demanded, but can only enhance their money prices. Now the most common observation shows that an increase in demand will in some instances leave the market prices of commodities 
altogether unchanged and will in other instances cause a temporary rise of market prices followed by an increased supply followed by a reduction of the prices to their original level and in many cases below their original level whether the rise of demand springs from surplus wages or any other cause does not at all change the conditions of the problem. From citizens, Citizen Weston's standpoint, the general phenomenon was as difficult to explain as the phenomenon occurring under the exceptional circumstances of a rise of wages. His argument had therefore no peculiar bearing whatever upon the subject we treat. It only expressed his perplexity at accounting for the laws by which an increase of demand produces an increase of supply instead of an ultimate rise in market prices. On the second day of the debate, our friend Weston clothes his old assertions in new forms. He said, consequent upon a general rise in money wages, more currency will, wanted, will be wanted to pay the same wages. The currency being fixed, how can you pick, pay with this fixed currency increased money wages? The first difficulty arose from the fixed amount of commodities accruing to the working man, despite his increase of money wages. Now it arises from the increased money wages, despite the fixed amount of commodities. Of course, if you reject his original dogma, his second grievance will disappear. However, I shall show that this currency question has nothing at all to do with the subject before us. In your country, the mechanism of payments is much more perfected than any other country in Europe. Thanks to the extent and concentration of the banking system, much less currency is wanted to circulate the same amount of values and to transact the same or greater amount of business. For example, as far as wages are concerned, the English factory operative pays his wages weekly to the shopkeeper, who sends them weekly to the banker, who returns them weekly to the manufacturer, who again pays them away to his working men, and so forth. By this contrivance, the yearly wages of an operative say of 52 pounds, may be paid by one single sovereign turning round every week in the same circle. Even in England, the mechanism is less perfect than in Scotland, and it is not everywhere equally perfect. And therefore we find, for example, that in some agricultural districts, more currency is wanted to circulate a sm much smaller amount of values. If you cross the channel, you will find that the money wages are much lower than in England, but they are circulated in Germany, Italy, Switzerland, and France by a much larger amount of currency. The same sovereign will not be so quickly intercepted by the banker or returned to the industrial capitalist, and therefore, instead of one sovereign circulating 52 pounds yearly, you want perhaps three sovereigns to circulate yearly wages to the amount of 25 pounds. Thus, by comparing the continental countries with England, you will see at once that low money wages may require a much larger currency for their circulation than high money wages, and that this is, in fact, merely a technical point, quite foreign to our subject. According to the best calculations I know, the yearly income of the working class of this country may be estimated at 250 million pounds. This immense sum is circulated by about 3 million pounds. Suppose a rise of wages of 50% to take place. Then, instead of this 3 millions of currency, 4.5 millions would be wanted. As a very considerable part of the working man's daily expenses is laid out in silver and copper, that is to say in mere tokens, whose relative value to gold is arbitrarily fixed by law, like that of incontrovertible money paper, 
A rise of money wages by 50% would, in the extreme case, require an additional circulation of sovereigns, say, to the amount of one million. One million now dormant in the shape of bullion or gold in the cellars of the Bank of England or of private bankers would circulate. But even, the, but even the trifling expense resulting from the additional minting or additional wear and tear of that million might be spared and would actually be spared if any friction should arise from the want of, it, of the additional currency. All, all of you know that the currency of this country is divided into two great departments. One sort, supplied by banknotes of different descriptions, is used in transactions between dealers and dealers, and larger payments from consumers to dealers, while another, another sort of currency, metallic coin, circulates in the retail trade. Although distinct, these two sorts of currency intermix with each other. Thus, gold coin, to a very great extent, circulates in even larger payments for all the odd sums under five pounds. If tomorrow four pound notes or three pound notes or two pound notes were issued, the gold filling these channels of circulation would at once be driven out of them and flow into those channels where they would be most needed from the increase of money wages. Thus the additional million required by an advance of wages by 50% would be supplied without the addition of one single sovereign. The same effect might be produced without one additional banknote by an additional bill's cir circulation, as was the case in Lan Lancashire for a considerable time. If a general rise in the rate of wages, for example, of 100%, as Citizen Weston supposed it to take place in agricultural wages, would produce a great rise in the price of necessaries and according to his views require an additional amount of currency not to be procured. A general fall in wages must produce the same effect on the same scale in the opposite direction. Well, all of you know that the years 1858 to 1860 were the most prosperous years for the cotton industry and Peculiarly, the year 1860 stands in that respect unrivaled in the annals of commerce, while at the same time all other branches of industry were most flourishing. The wages of the cotton operatives and all other working men connected with their trade stood in 1860 higher than ever before. The American crisis came those aggregate wages were suddenly reduced to about one-fourth of their former amount. This would have been, in the opposite direction, a rise of 400 percent. If wages rise from 5 to 20, we say that they rise by 400 percent. If they fall from 20 to 5, we say that they fall by 75 percent. But the amount of the rise in the one and the amount of the fall in the other case would be the same, namely 15 shillings. This then was a sudden change in the rate of wages, unprecedented, and at the same time extending over a number of operatives, which if we count all the operatives, not only directly engaged but indirectly depended upon the cotton trade, was larger by one half than the number of agricultural laborers. Did the price of wheat fall? It rose from the annual average of 47 shillings 8d per quarter during the three years 1858 to 1860 to the annual average of 55 shillings 10d per quarter during the three years 1861 to 1863. As to the currency, there were coined in, in, the lim, in the mint in 1861, 8,673,323 pounds against 
1792 pounds in 1860. That is to say, there were coined 5,294,440 pounds more in 1861 than in 1860. It is true the banknote circulation was in 1861 less by 1,319,000 pounds than in 1860. Take this off. There remains still a surplus of currency for the year 1861 as compared with the prosperity year 1860 to the amount of 3,975,440 pounds in 1860 or about 4 million pounds. But the bullion reserve in the Bank of England had simul simultaneously decreased, not quite to the same, but in an approximating proportion. Compare the year 1862 with 1842. Apart from the immense increase in the value and amount of commodities circulated in 1862, capital paid in regular transactions for shares, loans, etc., for railways in England and Wales, amounted alone to 320 million pounds, a sum which uh, that would have appeared fabulous in 1842. Still, the aggregate amounts of currency in 1862 and 1842 were pretty nearly equal, and generally you will find a, ten a tendency to a progressive diminution of currency in the face of enormous increasing value, not only of commodities, but of monetary transactions generally. From our friend Weston's standpoint, this is an insolvable riddle. Look, <clears throat> looking somewhat deeper into this matter, he would have found that quite apart from wages and supposing them to be fixed, the value and mass of commodities to be circulated and generally the amount of monetary transactions to be settled vary daily. And the amount of banknotes issued varies daily. The amount of payments realized without the intervention of any money by instrumentality of bills, checks, book credits, clearing houses varies daily. That as far as actual metallic concern, currency is, is required, the proportion between the coin and circulation and the coin and bullion in reserve or sleeping in the cellars of banks varies daily. That the amount of bullion absorbed by the national circulation and the amount being sent abroad for international circulation vary daily. He would have found that this dogma of a fixed currency is a monstrous error, incompatible with our everyday movement. He would have inquired into the laws which enable a currency to adapt itself to circumstances so continually changing, instead of turning his misconception of the laws of currency into an argument against a rise of wages. Our friend Weston accepts the est meter studorium. That is to say, that repetition is the mother of study, and consequently, he repeated his original dogma, again, under a new form, that the contraction of currency resulted, resulting from an enhancement of wages would produce a diminution of capital, and so forth. Having already dealt with this currency crochet, I consider it quite useless to enter upon the imaginary consequences he fancies to flow from his imaginary currency mishap. I shall proceed at once to reduce his one and the same dogma, repeated in so many different shapes, to its simplest theoretical form. The uncritical way he has treated his subject will become evident from one single remark. He pleads against a rise of wages or against high wages as the result of such a rise. Now I ask him, why are high wages, or no, what are high wages and what are, are low wages? Why constitute, for example, five shillings weekly low 
and 20 shillings weekly high wages. If 5 is low compared with 20, 20 is still lower as compared with 200. If a man was to lecture on the thermometer and commence by declaiming on high and low degrees, he would impart no knowledge whatever. He must first tell me how the freezing point is found out and how the boiling point and how these standard points are settled by natural laws, not, not the fancy of sellers or buyers of thermometers. Now in regard to wages and profits, Citizen Weston has not only failed to deduce such standard points from economical laws, but he has not even felt the necessity to look after them. He satisfied himself with the acceptance of the popular slang terms of low and high as something having a fixed meaning, although it is self-evident that wages can only be said to be high or low as compared with a standard by which to measure their magnitudes. He will be unable to tell me why a certain amount of money is given for a certain amount of labor. If he should answer me, this was settled by the law of supply and demand. I should ask him, in the first instance, by what law supply and demand are themselves regulated. And such an answer would at once put him out of court. The relations between supply and demand of labor undergo perpetual change, and with them, the market price prices of labor. If the demand overshoots the supply, wages rise. If the supply overshoots the demand, wages sink. Although it might be in such circumstances necessary to test the real state of demand and supply by a strike, for example, or by any other method. But if you accept supply and demand as the law regulating wages, it would be childish as useless to declaim against a rise of wages because, according to the supreme law you appeal to, a periodical rise of wages is quite as necessary and legitimate as a periodical fall in wages. If you do not accept supply and demand as the law regulating wages, I again repeat the question, why a certain amount of money is given for a certain amount of labor? But to consider matters more broadly, you would be altogether mistaken in fancying that the value of labor or any other commodity, whatever, is ultimately fixed by supply and demand. Supply and demand regulate nothing but the temporary fluctuation in market prices. They will explain to you why the market price of a commodity rises above or sinks below its value, but they can never account for the value itself. Suppose supply and demand to equilibrate, or as the economies, economists call it, to cover each other. Why, the very moment these opposite forces become equal, they paralyze each other and cease to work in the one or other direction. At the moment when supply and demand equilibrate each other and therefore cease to act, the market price of a commodity coincides with its real value, with the standard price around which its market prices oscillate. In inquiring into the nature of that value, we have therefore nothing at all to do with the temporary effects on market prices of supply and demand. The same holds true of wages and of the prices of all other now arrived at, the, at a point where I must enter upon the real development of the question. I cannot promise to do this in a very satisfactory way because to do so I should be obliged to go over the whole field of political economy. I can, as the French would say, but effleure la question, touch upon the main points. 
The first question we have to put is, what is the value of a commodity? How is it determined? At first sight, it would seem that the value of a commodity is a, is a quite relative and not to be settled without considering one commodity and its relations to all other commodities. In fact, in speaking of the value, the value in exchange of a commodity, we mean the proportional quantities in, in which it exchanges with all other commodities. But then arises the question, how are the proportions in which commodities exchange with each other regulated? We know from experience that these proportions vary infinitely. Taking one single commodity, wheat for instance, we shall find that a quarter of wheat exchanges in almost countless variations of proportion with other commodities. Yet its value remaining always the same, whether expressed in silk, gold, or any other commodity, it must be something distinct from and independent of these different rates of exchange with different articles. It must be possible to express in a very different form these various equations with various commodities. Besides, if I say a quarter of wheat exchanges with iron in a certain proportion, or the value of a quarter of wheat is expressed in a certain amount of iron, I say that the value of wheat and its equivalent in iron are equal to some third thing, which is neither wheat nor iron. Because I suppose that to, to express the same magnitude in two different shapes. Either of them, wheat or the iron, must therefore, independently of the other, be reducible to this third thing, which is their common measure. To elucidate this point, I shall recur to a very simple geometrical illustration. In comparing the areas of triangles of all possible forms and magnitudes, or comparing triangles with rectangles, or any other rectilinear figure, how do we proceed? We, we reduce the area of any triangle, whatever, to an expression quite different from the visible form. Having found from the nature of the triangle that its area is equal to half its product of its base by its height, we can then compare the different values of all sorts of triangles and of all rectilinear figures, whatever, because all of them may be resolved into a certain um, number of triangles. The same mode of procedure must obtain with the values of commodities. We must be able to reduce all of them to an expression common to all, and distinguish them, distinguishing them only by the proportions in which they contain that identical measure. As the exchangeable values of commodities are only social functions of those things and have nothing at all to do with the natural qualities, we must first ask, ask what is the common substance of all commodities? It is labor. To produce a commodity, a certain amount of labor must be bestowed upon it or worked up in it. And I say not only labor, but social labor. A man who produces an article for his own immediate use to consume it himself creates a product, but not a commodity. As a self-sustaining producer, he has nothing to do with society. But to produce a commodity, a man must not only produce an article satisfying some social want, but his labor itself must form part and parcel of the total sum of labor expended by society. It must subordinate to the division of labor within society. 
It is nothing without the other divisions of labor and, on its part, is required to integrate them. If we consider commodities as values, we consider them exclusively under the single aspect of realized, fixed, or if you like, crystallized social labor. In this respect, they can differ only by representing greater or smaller amounts of labor. As for example, a greater amount of labor may be worked up in a silken handkerchief than a brick. But how does one measure these quantities of labor? By the time the labor lasts. In measuring the labor by the hour, the day, etc. Of course, to apply this measure, all sorts all sorts of labor are reduced to average or simple labor as their unit. We arrive therefore at this conclusion. A commodity has value because it is a crystallization of social labor. The greatness of its value or its relative value depends upon the greater or less amount of that social substance contained in it. That is to say, on the relative mass of labor necessary for its production. The relative values of commodities are therefore determined by the respective quantities or amounts of labor worked up, realized, and fixed in them. The correlative quantities of commodities which can be produced in the same time of labor are equal. Or the value of one commodity is to the value of another commodity as the quantity of labor fixed in the one is to the quantity of labor fixed in the other. I suspect that many of you will ask, does then in Indeed, there exists such a vast or any difference whatever between determining the values of commodities by wages and determining them by the relative quantities of ne labor necessary for their production. You must, however, be aware that the reward for labor, the quantity of labor, are quite disparate things. Suppose, for example, equal quantities of labor to be fixed in one quarter of wheat and one ounce of gold. I resort to the example because it was used by Benjamin Franklin in his first essay published in 1721 and entitled A Modest Inquiry into the Nature and the Necessity of a Paper Currency where he, one of the first, hit upon the true nature of value. Well, we suppose then that one quarter of wheat and one ounce of gold are equal values or equivalents because they are crystallizations of equal amounts of average labor or so many days or so many weeks labor respectively fixed in them. In thus determining the relative values of gold and corn, do we refer in any way, whatever, to the wages of the agricultural laborer and the miner? Not a bit. We leave it quite indeterminate how their days or weeks labor was paid, or even whether wage labor was employed at all. If it was, wages may have been very unequal. The labor, laborer whose labor is realized in the quarter of wheat may receive only two bushels, and the laborer employed in the mining may receive one half of the ounce of gold. Or, supposing their wages to be equal, 
they may deviate in all proportions from the values of the commodities produced by them. They, amount, they may amount to one-fourth or one-fifth or any other proportional part of that one-quarter of corn or the one ounce of gold. Their wages can, of course, not exceed nor be more than the values of the commodities they produced. But they can be less in every possible degree. Their wages will be limited by the values of the products, but the values of their products will not be limited by their wages. And above all, the values, the relative values of corn and gold, for example, will have been settled without regard, whatever, to the value of labor employed. That is to say, to wages. To determine the values of commodities by the relative quantities of labor fixed in them is therefore a thing quite different from the topological method of determining the values of commodities by the value of labor or wages. This point, however, will be further elucidated in the progress of our inquiry. In calculating the exchangeable value of a commodity, we must add to the quantity of labor previously worked up in the raw material of the commodity and the labor bestowed on the implements, tools, machineries, and buildings with which such labor is assisted. For example, the value of a certain amount of cotton yarn is the crystallization of the quantity of labor added to the cotton during the spinning process. The quantity of labor previously realized in the cotton itself, the quantity of labor realized in the coal, oil, and other auxiliary substances used, the quantity of labor fixed in the steam engine, the spindles, the factory building, and so forth. Instruments of production, properly so called, such as tools, machinery, buildings, serve again and again for longer or shorter periods during repeated repro processes of production. If they were used up at once, like the raw material, their whole value would be at, at once transferred to the commodities they assist in producing. But as a spindle, for example, is gradually used up, an average calculation is made based upon average time it lasts and its average waste or wear and tear during a certain period, say a day. In this way, we calculate how much of the value of the spindle is transferred to the yarn daily spun and how much, therefore, the total amount of labor realized in a pound of yarn, for example, is due to the quantity of labor previously realized in the spindle. For our present purpose, it is not necessary to dwell any longer on this point. It might seem that if the value of a commodity is determined by the quantity of labor bestowed upon its production, the lazier man, or the clumsier a man, the more valuable his commodity because the greater time of labor required for finishing the commodity. This, however, would be a sad mistake. You will recollect that I use the word social labor. And many points are involved in this qualification of social. In saying that the value of a commodity is determined by the quantity of labor worked up or crystallized in it, we mean the quantity of labor necessary for its production in a given state of society under certain social average conditions of production with a given social average intensity and average skill of the labor employed. When in England the power loom came to compete with the hand loom, only half the former time of labor was wanted to convert a given amount of yarn into a yard of cotton cloth. The poor hand loom weaver now worked seven, 
17 or 18 hours daily instead of the 9 or 10 hours he had worked before. Still, the product of 20 hours of his labor represented now only 10 hours of labor, or 10 hours of labor socially necessary for the conversion of a certain amount of yarn into textile stuffs. His product of 20 hours had, therefore, no more value than his former product of 10 hours. If then the quantity of socially necessary labor realized in commodities regulates their exchangeable values, every increase in the quantity of labor wanted for the production of a commodity must augment its value, as every diminution must lower it. If the respective quantities of labor necessary for the production of the respective commodities remain constant, their relative values also would be constant. But such is not the case. The quantity of labor necessary for the production of a commodity changes continuously with the changes in the productive powers of labor. The more produce is finished in a given time of labor and the smaller the productive powers of labor, the less produce is finished in the same time. If, for example, in the progress of population, it should become necessary to cultivate less fertile soils, the same amount of agricultural produce would consequently rise. On the other hand, if with modern means of production, a single spinner converts into yarn during one working day many thousand times the amount of cotton which he could have spun in the same time with the spinning wheel, it is evident that every single pound of cotton will absorb many thousand times less of spinning labor than it did before. And consequently, the value added by spinning to every single pound of cotton will be a thousand times less than before. The value of cotton will sink accordingly. Apart from the different natural energies and acquired working abilities of different peoples, the productive powers of labor must principally depend, firstly, upon the natural conditions of labor, such as the fertility of soils, mines, and so forth. Secondly, upon the progressive improvement of the social powers of labor, such as are derived from from production on a grand scale, concentration of capital, and combination of labor, subdivision of labor, machinery, improved methods, appliance of chemical and other natural agencies, shortening of time and space by means of communication and transport, and every other contrivance by which science presses natural agencies into the service of labor, and by which the social or cooperative character of labor is developed. The greater the productive powers of labor, the less labor is bestowed upon a given amount of produce. Hence, the smaller the value of the produce. The smaller the productive powers of labor, the more labor is bestowed upon the same amount of produce. Hence, the greater its value. As a general law, we may therefore set it down that the values of commodities are directly as the times of labor employed in their production and in inversely as the productive powers of labor. Only spoken of value, I shall add a few words about price, which is a peculiar form of value. Price taken by itself is nothing but the monetary expression of value. The values of all commodities of the country, for example, are expressed in gold prices, while on the continent they are mainly expressed in silver prices. The value of gold or silver, like that of all other commodities, is regulated by the quantity of labor necessary for getting them. You exchange a certain amount of your national products, in which a certain amount of your national labor is crystallized. For the produce of gold and silver producing countries, 
in which a certain quantity of their labor is crystallized. In this way, in fact, by barter, that you learn to express in gold and silver the values of all commodities. That is, in the respective quantities of labor bestowed upon them. Looking somewhat closer into the monetary expression of value, or what comes to the same, the conversion of value into price, you will find that it is a process by which you give to the values of all commodities an independent and homogeneous form, or by which you express them as quantities of equal social labor. So far as it is but the monetary expression of value, price has been called natural price by Adam Smith, prix nécessaire by the French physiocrats. What then is the relation between value and market prices? Or between natural prices and market prices? You all know that the market price is the same for all commodities of the same kind. However, the conditions of production may differ for di individual producers. The market price expresses only the average amount of social labor necessary under average conditions of production to supply the market with a certain mass of a certain article. It is calculated upon the whole lot of commodity of a certain description. So far, market price of a commodity coincides with its value. On the other hand, the oscillations of market prices rising over, sinking now under the value or natural price, depend upon the fluctuations of supply and demand. The deviations of market prices from values are continual, but as Adam Smith says, and I quote, the natural price is the central price to which the prices of commodities are continually gravitating. Different accidents may sometimes keep them suspended a good deal above it and sometimes force them down, even somewhat below it. But whatever may be the obstacles which hinder them from settling in the center of repose and continuance, they are constantly tending toward it." Unquote. I cannot now sift this matter. It suffices to say that if the supply and demand equilibrate each other, the market prices of commodities will correspond with their natural prices, that is to say, with their values, as determined by the respective quantities of labor required for their production. But supply and demand must constantly tend to equilibrate each other although they do do so only by compensating one fluctuation by another, a rise by a fall, and vice versa. If instead of considering only the daily fluctuations, you analyze the movement of market prices for longer periods, as Mr. Took, for example, has done in his History of Prices, you will find that the fluctuations of market prices other so that apart from the effect of monopolies and some other modifications I must now pass by, all descriptions of commodities are on average sold at their respective values or natural prices. The average periods during which the fluctuations of market prices compensate each other are different for different kinds of commodities, because with one kind, it is easier to adapt supply to demand than with, another, with the other. If then speaking broadly and embracing somewhat longer periods, all descriptions of commodities sell at their respective values, it is nonsense to, su to suppose that profit, not in individual cases, 
but at their constant and usual profits of different trades spring from the prices of commodities or selling them at a price over and above their value. The absurdity of this notion becomes evident if it is generalized. What a man would constantly win as a seller, he would constantly lose as a purchaser. It would not do to say that there are men who are buyers without being sellers, or consumers without being producers. What these people pay to the producers, they must first get from them for nothing. If a man first takes your money and afterwards returns that money in buying your commodities, you will never enrich yourselves by selling your commodities too dear to that same man. This sort of transaction might diminish a loss, but would never help in realizing a profit. To explain, therefore, the general nature of profits, you must start from the theorem that on an average, commodities are sold at their real values, and profits are derived from selling them at their values, that is, in proportion to the quantity of labor realized in them. If you cannot explain profit upon this supposition, you cannot explain it at all. This seems paradox and contrary to everyday observation. It is also paradox that the earth moves around the sun and that water consists of two highly inflammable gases. Scientific truth is always paradox, if judged by everyday experience, which catches only the delusive appearance of things.